Afternoon, everybody. Thanks for your patience. I'd like to suggest a new view about the role of consciousness in perceptual decisions. Um, according to this view, consciousness itself can be uncertain in that it can include representations of competing possibilities, each of which is weighted by a degree of uncertainty. Uh, to better understand this view and its rivals, let's consider a very simple task. In this task, subjects are asked to whether a grading is oriented leftward or rightward. Most subjects have no trouble categorizing this grading as leftward. Some gradients are harder to categorize. This gradient is harder to categorize because the, its orientation is closer to 90 degrees. This grading is harder to categorize because its contrast is so low. A natural explanation for why this grading is harder to categorize is that our measurements of its orientation are more likely to be further away from its actual orientation. In other words, our measurements are less reliable. When our measurements are less reliable, it can be useful to rely on information about the orientations of past gradings. For example, if most of our gradings were oriented rightward, we might use that information to bias our decision about the current grading. We would then be using our information about past gradings as a kind of prior. The extent to which our decisions about the current grading sh should be biased toward our prior depends on the reliability of our measurement. For example, if the contrast is high and our measurement is therefore more reliable, our decision shouldn't be as biased toward our prior. Some human and non-human subjects are near optimal in the sense, on these kinds of tasks, in the sense that the extent to which they rely on the prior depends on the reliability of their measurement. Some even seem able to learn the correct reliability of their measurements and the correct prior. To many, this seems like compelling evidence that these subjects are relying on representations of uncertainty. In particular, that they are relying on a representation of the reliability of their measurement, which involves an element of uncertainty, and a representation of a prior, which also involves an element of uncertainty. Both representations seem to play an important role in perceptual decisions. This leads to an important but rarely discussed question, namely, what is the relation between these representations and consciousness? That is, what is the relation between the subject's uncertainty and consciousness? There are at least four views, so let's consider them one by one, continuing to focus on this particular task. According to the first view, uncertainty precedes consciousness. Let's start, there's a couple of versions of this. Let's start with the simplest version. The simplest version is that there are representations of uncertainty in, um, in pre-conscious processes that together are combined to produce a point estimate of the grading's orientation. That point estimate is then promoted into consciousness when it is then broadcast to the post-conscious uh, processes that are responsible for the decision about whether the grading is, is, is oriented leftward or rightward. A more sophisticated version of this view would have it that those earlier representations of uncertainty about reliability and the prior give rise to a, a distribution of uncertainty over possible orientations. And one particular orientation is then selected from that distribution, maybe the one assigned the least uncertainty, which is then promoted into consciousness and broadcast to the uh, processes responsible for making the ultimate um, decision. There are also versions of this view where instead of producing point estimates, instead what's produced are ranges of values. Say, for example, the range of values within one standard deviation of the mean of whatever um, uncertainties are represented um, in the pre-conscious processes. In any case, on this first view, the role of consciousness is to broadcast an estimate that results from pre-conscious representations of uncertainty. At least from an engineering point of view, uh, one disadvantage of this arrangement is that uncertainty is then not accessible by later processes, even though that uncertainty might be useful. For example, it might be useful when a subject is trying to decide how to respond to asymmetrical um, rewards. Uh, the second view, the uncertainty uh, follows consciousness and instead, uh, instead of preceding it. There are again several variants. One view is that pre-conscious processes just maybe through some lookup table or some more complicated version of a lookup table give rise to a point estimate that is then promoted into consciousness and then broadcast to later um, processes. These later processes then use that point estimate to generate a representation of uncertainty. For example, if it's a low contrast uh, grading, these later processes might rely on a background belief like if the grading has a low contrast, 
then I should not be very comp not assign a lot of certainty to whatever point estimate arises um, through consciousness. Um, as before, you can also have versions of this view which use ranges instead of um, point values. Perhaps the most sophisticated version of this view uses the sequential point estimates or ranges to produce the distribution in a way, uses them, it's 80 degrees, 80 degrees, 81, 79, 80. Eventually from all of those different samples, all those different point estimates, you could reconstruct um, an uncertainty. Um, in any case, the role of consciousness on this kind of view um, is to broadcast an initial point estimate or range to the processes that then generate representations of uncertainty. From an engineering point of view, this again has some disadvantages. In particular, a disadvantage of this arrangement is there's a loss of information from the early processes that might have been useful um, when trying to come up with the correct um, assignment of uncertainty at the post-conscious level. For example, the spread of activity over the detectors of orientation detectors is very useful information uh, when trying to figure out how um, much how reliable one's measurements are and therefore how much certainty one should have in the relevant point estimate. So in that sense there's a disadvantage. A third view which you saw coming is that you could have representations of uncertainty both pre-conscious and post-conscious. Uh, the earlier representation of uncertainty might give rise to a point estimate or range and later processes do their best to generate another representation of uncertainty perhaps using um, background beliefs about contrast or other, other variables. Um, another version of this would be you could take samples from this earlier distribution and then use those samples sequentially over time to rebuild something like a, um, what your uncertainty should be. Of course, a natural, um, from an engineering point, a natural problem with that approach is that only at the limit of infinite time will these be guaranteed to be um, identical. And there's room for lots of error um, from the random samples that are taken. The random samples might not ultimately produce an uncertainty representation that matches the one that preceded um, consciousness. There is also a version of this which is not properly depicted here, which is that you could think about there being two channels that leading to the post-conscious uh, processes. One goes through consciousness that gives you just, say, a point estimate, and another that gives probabilistic representation through a different channel um, up to those um, processes. So consciousness would give you some kind of a um, um, non-probabilistic snapshot of the world, and the probabilistic representations would make their way into decision-making through other channels. We would then be, um, all of us would then be something we like you might call probabilistic blindsiders in the sense that there would be information about the stimulus, probabilistic information that makes its way into decision making but then not through the channel of um, consciousness. You might even then worry that on this kind of view consciousness becomes epiphenomenal in the decision. Um, some people might not regard that as a, um, as a disadvantage, but it strikes me as one that's at least at odd with the introspective evidence. In any case, the role of consciousness on this third kind of view is to broadcast an earlier estimate that generates representations of uncertainty. Now, before I go on to the fourth view, keep in mind that the three views I just mentioned are not supposed to be universally true or universally false. One might be true for a given task in a given subject, another might be true for a different task in a different subject. Um, uh, Okay, so the fourth view is the one that I would like to suggest. Um, on this view, consciousness itself is uncertain in that it can include a representation of competing possibilities, each weighted by a degree of uncertainty. Note that the uncertainties as it moves through this stream of information needn't be identical to each other and they could be modified as, say, later priors come into play, later information comes into play. Um, but nonetheless, uncertainty propagates from the, the earlier pre-conscious processes through the post-conscious process and goes through, in particular, um, through consciousness itself. One of the reasons why, from an, from an engineering point of view, that this is uh, potentially uh, advantageous is that you might end up making better decisions because you don't lose important information earlier about, that goes into generating these representations of uncertainty and therefore you might end up with a better representation of uncertainty that comes um, later. Um, as far as I can tell, I'm the first to develop and endorse this view. Um, for the most part, neuroscientists and psychologists just avoid the question altogether because outside of this room, most aren't willing to make claims about consciousness, including its role in decision making. Um, when it is discussed, it seems, as far as I can tell, it is always quickly dismissed. So one of the few um, psychologists to talk about it is Larry Maloney. Um, and Larry is a vision scientist at NYU. After noting that it would be beneficial to decision-making if this was indeed the way the mind was arranged, he quickly dismisses it. 
um, he asks a question. It's not working. Um, what does it mean to perceive a distribution rather than a point estimate? And without further elaboration, sets this uh, view aside, seemingly think that there's just no good way of making sense of the view that c conscious perception itself could be uncertain in the sense that I've described. Um, Richard Holton, in a criticism of predictive coding, um, writes as follows. He says, at the level of what we see, rather than what, of what our unconscious visual systems are doing, we don't have a graded continuum of confidence in different hypotheses. Perceptions are all or nothing. And in response to Clark and, and to my own work, uh, Andy, uh, sorry, Holton and my own work, Andy Clark has written, uh, our perceptual worlds display unity and coherence and depict a single way um, things are. So there's a lot of skepticism about this fourth view. It seems to many people to be incoherent or they're unable to make um, good sense of it. Um, I think it's also worth noting that none of these argument authors really give anything like a, an argument for their view. They just seem to find the, the view I'm just on conscious uncertainty to be, to be prima facie absurd. I find that when confronted with skeptics like this, the best way to proceed is through a consideration of examples. Um, and I find, not with all skeptics, but some skeptics can really get to see that there's more to the view than they might have initially, um, initially thought. So suppose you are, see a figure walking towards you in the distance. When the figure gets close enough, you might report, ah, that looks like it might be my friend Isaac, so a friend from college. And when the figure gets closer, you might report, oh, that's probably my friend Isaac. And when the figure's right in front of you, you might say, ah, here's Isaac. So all of these reports reflect what you believe, your increasing belief that it is Isaac. But these reports also seem to capture something about the experience itself. Recognition is not our nothing. Sometimes it seems like we're, we recognize someone in a way that it seems like it might be them, but even our visual system, our perceptual experience, our consciousness is not yet sure that it's them. And that's something that can come in degrees. Or suppose you're walking down a trail that you believe to be marked entirely by red trail markers. In the distance, you see a trail marker, and you might say to yourself, that looks as though it could be an orange trail marker. And you get closer, and it looks as though it's probably an orange. And you get right in front of you, oh, no, it's an orange one. I'm on the wrong trail. Once again, these reports unquestionably reflect what's going on at the level of what you believe. But I think they also, if you sort of vividly imagine these kinds of cases, they also capture something about your conscious um, perception itself. That, once again, are, we don't just perceive, consciously perceive the colors of things. Sometimes it's things seem to more likely have some colors than other colors. Um, another cause of um, conscious uncertainty is intensity. Suppose you're in a perfectly dark room and an experimenter tells you that at some point she's going to turn on a very dim light and slowly increase its intensity. At first you might report um, the room is completely dark. And then at some point you might say something like, it looks as though there could be a light on. And as the intensity increases, you might say, it looks as though there's probably a light on. It looks as though the light's on. Once again, it, the lights don't just look to be on or off. The level of consciousness, sometimes it seems as though a light could be on, although there isn't certainty. Um, another example, consider just things in the periphery. You hold up a number of fingers or you look at a grating in the periphery. It might look to you as though there, there are between, say, two and five fingers that are that are extended in your, in, in your periphery. But, uh, and between those, it might seem as though it's more likely there are three, say, than five. Um, but again, it's not the case that there seem to be some determinant numbers of fingers or determinant numbers of bars when viewed in your periphery. It rather seems as though that some possibilities are more likely than other possibilities. Another cause of uncertainty, the level of perception, is blur. So suppose you wear glasses and you go to the optometrist. And the optometrist asks you, is that an E or an F? Um, at first, you might say, I can't tell. But slowly over time, as she improves your visual acuity through a series of lenses, you might start to say things like, it looks as though it's probably an F. Uh, oh, it looks as though it's uh, very likely an F. It, oh, OK, now it, now it looks as though it's an F. But once again, these reports don't just reflect what's happening at the level of belief. I think they reflect what's happening at the level of perceptual consciousness. Shapes don't just look, figures don't just look to have one particular shape or another. Sometimes they look as though they have one shape more likely than a different shape. Um, suppose you're sitting in a car, and as the car suddenly makes a, a right turn, and they ask, they ask you to estimate um, what was the angle at which the car turned, you might say, ah, oh, it was somewhere between, say, 80 and, and 100 degrees. Um, but then they turn the car, the car continues, it turns again at the same angle, this time at a much slower speed. Now you might have a much more specific estimate. Now it feels more concrete that the car turned at a perpendicular angle rather than something that was um, wider or narrower. So when we move around in the world, we don't just always feel as though we're moving at some particular direction, at some particular orientation. Sometimes it feels as though we more likely moved at some orientation 
um, rather than a different orientation. Um, or suppose you're, you're in a crowded party and you hear your friend's distinctive voice across the room um, and you ask yourself, where's, where's my friend coming from? Somewhere over by the kitchen. Um, but as the crowd begins to thin out and fewer and fewer people are in the room, you might start to re report more and more certainty about their exact location. Um, what this shows is that where sounds seem to be coming from is not something definite. There's no, not a point or a range. It's sometimes the level of consciousness seems as though some locations are more likely than other locations. And we can adjust the, the, uh, the distribution of that, of that certainty um, um, over time. Okay, th these are just a few of the causes of uh, uncertainty, the level of consciousness. When the object's in the distance, when it's not intense, when it's peripheral, when it's blurred, uh, speed and noise. It's also when the object is small, occluded, moving, changing, vibrating, or semi-transparent. When you are intoxicated, tired, distracted, surprised, confused, and inattentive. And one of the things that I think is helpful about considering so many examples is that when you just consider one example by itself, it might seem there's some other explanation for what's going on. But when you consider the, the number and the diversity of examples in which there seems to be uncertainty at the level of conscious perception, it starts to seem that there's something more unified going on in all these cases. The consciousness itself is not something that's either yes or no. It's something that can be graded in the sense that it presents us with possibilities, some of which seem um, more certain than others. So I've given, these examples by themselves are not arguments, so they're mostly just sort of warm-up acts. Um, so in written, published work, I, uh, I've given one argument, a first personal argument from introspection. I'm just going to quickly sketch what the argument looks like, and if you're interested more, we can talk about it, or, or, you, or um, you can find the paper on, on my website. Um, and then I'll, then I'll consider what a third personal empirical argument for the view uh, might look like. So th um, the first person argument asks what happens when you completely trust your conscious perception. So what is it to completely trust your conscious perception? Well, when you completely trust a doctor, plumber, or rabbi, you know what that is, you follow their advice. Um, the rabbi example is not uh, an audience <laughs> pleaser. So. Okay. Likewise, when you completely trust a thermometer, a spectrometer, or a barometer, you just accept its measurement, whatever it says. Continuing this pattern, when you completely trust your conscious perception, you, uh, you endorse the way that it presents objects. And completely trusting someone or something doesn't always result in complete certainty. If you completely trust your doctor and she's 40% certain um, that your leg is fractured, you'll end up with 40% certainty that your leg is fractured. Or if you completely trust your meteorologist, shouldn't, but if you completely trust your meteorologist and they say there's a 70% chance of rain tomorrow, then you'll end up believing there's a 70% chance of rain tomorrow. So the thought is that when you completely trust something, you let it completely guide what your beliefs are going to be like. You mold your mind, your beliefs, around that source of information. And what I'm suggesting we can do is we can do the similar thing with our conscious perceptions. We can let it be the guide to what we should believe. Maybe you're not justified in ever doing this. Maybe it's hard to do, um, but it's something we can at least imagine. We can see what would happen if we just trusted our experience. And here's what I take to be a datum. Um, take the case of the, the figure that's approaching you from the distance. At some point when you completely trust your experience, you'll end up with 55% um, certainty that it's that your particular friend Isaac. So what's the best explanation for that? Well, the simplest explanation is that when you completely trusted your uh, conscious perception, and your conscious perception gave you the information, gave you the representation, um, that's Isaac. So, th and then you just uptook that into your belief, and that's why you ended up having a 55% certainty at the level of um, deliberate belief about um, who it is. Whereas the, uh, the other, view, um, other view is that, well, suppose you just represent that it's Isaac at that point. Then if you completely trusted your experience, you should end up with certainty that it's Isaac. Or if it failed to represent that it's Isaac, then you should end up with um, certainty that it's not Isaac. And so the argument here is that the best explanation for why we end up with this um, kind of mental state when we complete our trust, our conscious perception, is that it's this uncertainty is in the conscious perception itself. There's a lot more possibilities to consider here. There's a lot more back and forth. Um, but for now, I just want to give you a feel for the kind of introspective arguments that, that I think we can give for the view. One can also give a more empirical third personal argument for the view. And the basic strategy is simple. What you want to do is find in the brain, before consciousness, a representation of uncertainty. And then you want to find, after consciousness, the same or similar, represent, or similar um, representation of uncertainty. And then the argument to the best explanation is that the, the reason why these things match is that the same uncertainty was in the conscious perception itself. So it's like if I told Daphna a secret, 
and I see here whisper something to Mike, and Mike comes over and tells me my secret back to me, the best explanation is that Daphne just told Mike uh, my secret. That not guaranteed, Mike just might have been a really good guesser, um, or Daphne might have not told him directly, but given him some clues that let him reconstruct. But still, the simplest and best explanation of why Mike just told me the secret back is that Daphne told him. Similarly, if we can find the same representation of uncertainty after consciousness in driving the decision making that we found before consciousness, then the best explanation is that that uncertainty was preserved through consciousness, um, and that's why we ended up with the same um, kind of um, 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 uh, representations of uncertainty. Um, but look, this kind of argument is really hard. So I have another paper um, where I go through what I consider the best empirical evidence for this, and it all comes up just a little bit short. But in a way, that makes me hopeful that future empirical evidence is going to let us run an argument like this more successfully. I'm not going to go through those specific empirical studies now. I just want to point out some of the reasons why this is a difficult argument to give. One is that you need to make sure that you found a region in the brain that is preceding consciousness. And that's hard, because we really have no idea where consciousness um, uh, arises in the brain. Some people even think it uh, arises in the visual cortex, making it very hard for us to find regions that are uncontroversially um, precede um, consciousness. But still, they seem like if you find something in the visual cortex, maybe even MT, um, um, then, then maybe you should, have some, you should have some confidence in the argument. Another thing that's really hard about this is we can test for these representations of uncertainty by manipulating, say, the rewards. Or, um, or, or other, other experimental variables. Another thing that's hard about identifying these representations of uncertainty is to make sure we've found a genuine representation of uncertainty rather than a representation of whatever evidence or data is later used to generate a representation of uncertainty. So in our toy task, that would be a representation of contrast that is later then used to generate a representation of uncertainty about the orientation of the stimulus. So in, in the same way, like, um, you don't want to think that, you know, Sherlock Holmes comes into a room, maybe you can predict um, who he's going to say did it, but it's going to take him a long time to piece together the evidence to figure it out. So likewise, we, don't want, we want to make sure we're not just finding the representations of the evidence that later is what allows the brain to figure out um, what the uncertainty is. And that can be difficult. And I think really the only way to do that is to show that preceding consciousness, we have some, the representations are involved in probabilistic inferences uh, of the kind that suggest the brain is already treating these as representations of uncertainty and not as the um, other independent variables. Um, we also need to make sure that the um, representations aren't going through an independent channel um, and are going through consciousness, that there's not another route to it. Um, and that can be tricky, but I think can be done in part by looking to see if there's dissociations between the conscious representation and whatever would come through a different, uh, different channel. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about arguments. Uh, now I just want to give you a list of some implications. So in published work, I've talked about some implications that I think philosophers uh, are likely to find interesting. And I'm not going to focus on those today. I'm going to try to f talk about implications that neuroscientists and psychologists um, might find more interesting. Um, although that's ultimately up to you to tell me whether I've um, found something. Um, so the first two are relatively obvious. Um, one is about the nature of consciousness. So many people think the nature of consciousness precludes the kind of uncertainty that I'm describing. Consciousness always gives us one scene at a time. Um, it shows the one possibility for the world to be. It doesn't give us a range of possibilities and weight them by degrees of uncertainty. Um, that, I think, was behind the skeptical claims by people like Clark and Maloney and, um, uh, and uh, guy's name. Um, another reason implication is something about the role of consciousness, in particular in decision making. So all of the other views I described give consciousness a different kind of role. It broadcasts the point estimate, which is later then used to generate a representation of uncertainty. Um, or it's supposed to be um, taking, collapsing the probabilistic uncertainty representations that precede consciousness and just giving us one point estimate to be the basis of our action. The, the role of consciousness on the view I'm describing is quite different. Consciousness is not there to, in a way, interfere with the representations of uncertainty. Consciousness is just there to pass it along in a way that makes it available to uh, many other systems for report or, or, or action. So consciousness is not interfering with decision making in the way that it is typically thought to. Um, another reason to be uh, interested in this view is its implications for other domains. So that is its generalizations. So t one might be a, under a conscious um, action. So suppose some, you're sitting at a table and someone slides the salt shaker towards you. At some point, it might 
seem to you is that you could possibly reach out and grab it. A second later, it seems as though you could probably get it, and a second later, it seems as though you can definitely get it. Or you know, you're, you're playing defense and there's a, against a, a soccer player, and it seems you know, you just, you're trying to poke it out. And at one point, it seems as though, ah, maybe I could get it. A second later, it seems I could probably get it. And then, it, then it may seem like I could definitely, I can stick this guy. Um, all of these actions, it seems to us, that present themselves to us consciously um, are presented with degrees of uncertainty. So just like in perception, perceptual consciousness comes uh, weighted with uncertainty, perhaps also action consciousness or, be, or behavioral consciousness, motor consciousness, also comes weighted with um, uncertainties. Another uh, possible implication, my interest to some of you, is, has to do with uh, memory. So for example, try to remember the color of the tablecloth um, that you, was on the table when you had breakfast this morning. Right? It might seem to you that there's only two options. Either you remember the color or you don't. And it might seem like there's only two options because it might seem like your memory of it is like an image. And an image either had some color in it in that location or it has no color in it in, it in that location. So just like pictures either have color at a location or don't, it might seem like memories have some bit of information or don't. The object was in my memory or it wasn't in my memory. The, uh, the object had a certain color in my memory or it didn't have that color in my memory. It might seem like we just have these two um, options. But if um, if conscious uncertainty is true, then it might extend to our memories as well. So it might be that my conscious episodic memory of, say, the tablecloth this morning was itself uncertain. Um, it doesn't include a particular color, a range of colors for the, for the tablecloth. It gives us some kind of sense of which colors are more likely than which other colors. And if, again, if this tr uncertainty view is true of, of perception, then it might also expect it to be true for memories, given that there's some evidence that in episodic memory, at least, um, some of the brain, same brain systems are involved in both of them. All right, maybe to give another example, suppose you're trying to decide between you know, Cheerios and Fruit Loops or some other kind of cereal. Um, on one view, um, what you do is you have memories of eating each of those cereals in the past and they give you some kind of value. Um, and that adds up to help you make this, this decision. But maybe when you call up these memories, it's not that they each give you some scalar value of how much pleasure you got out of them, how much value each of them had in it. Maybe there's some certain uncertainty attached to each of those uh, memories. Maybe some memories where there's more certainty about the conscious certainty about the amount of pleasure it gives you will have a bigger role in decision making than, um, as far as evaluating a certain option, than, than, other, than other ones. Um, you know, it might even be that over time what happens is that memories don't fade in the sense that like, th like details plop out of the memories. Um, but maybe what happens is that memories become more uncertain over time and to eventually some particular detail is just sort of flat across all possible shapes or colors or something like that. And maybe even one of the reasons why remembering and, and um, replay is so important in memory is that it helps us stop that process. So memories naturally are degrading in their certainties and maybe what happens when we recall those memories is that we're helping to um, counteract that effect, to make them more certain and therefore to make them more useful um, for, you, for future um, um, decision making. Okay, another reason, my implication of you that might be interesting is that it helps us draw a distinction between unconscious and uncertain. So if we're, say we're relying on reports to decide whether someone is conscious of a stimulus or not. It might be when they say that they're not conscious of it, what they really is going on is that they have very low certainty that there is a st stimulus there, a very low, um, very low certainty about the, nat the identity of that stimulus. So maybe in cases where we think a subject is unconscious, really they have just really low um, certainty about the stimulus. And that re seems really plausible in cases when they're showed the stimulus for extraordinarily short durations, like in some of these um, masking experiments. Um, so lots of measures that we have for deciding whether someone is conscious or not might be, in a way, confounding two different possibilities. They might, the possibility that they're really genuinely unconscious of the stimulus and the possibility that they have just extremely low certainty, um, uh, certainty about it. And so they say they're not conscious uh, in a way, this is like, you know, people having, some people have talked about how these reporting paradigms aren't great because people might be just using criterions for reporting. And this is maybe a more sophisticated way of thinking about that. Um, it's not just stimulus strength that's leading them to fail to report. It's, it's, um, it's uncertainty about the, at the level of consciousness about the relevant um, stimulus and its um, properties. Um, okay, another implication is about the difference between perceptual uncertainty versus metacognitive uncertainty. Suppose you take a task like the one I described and you ask a, su a subject to say whether it's tilted leftward or rightward. And then you ask the subject, uh, okay, how confident are you in that decision? Um, one 
one, one view is that um, if you thought the consciousness gave them some kind of point estimate, then you might think that their report of confidence has to be something more sophisticated, some reflection upon their own conscious perception and how reliable it was that gives them that confidence rating. But another possibility, if un uh, conscious uncertainty is true, is that they're just reporting something not higher order, not something reflective, but something about the conscious perception itself, its own uncertainty. So there's no reflection, there's no metacognition involved in the report of confidence. Instead, they're simply reporting a fact, a further feature of their conscious perception that hasn't already been um, studied or hasn't already been um, measured by the experiment. So uh, th there's a real danger that lots of experiments that purport to be about metacognition are in fact just about the uncertainties that are inherent to the conscious perceptions themselves. Um, so that's something else to keep in mind. Um, a final uh, potential implication is about the neural correlates of consciousness. Suppose that I'm right and that consciousness itself can involve representations of multiple possibilities and they are assigned um, degrees of uncertainty. Then in our search for the neural correlates of consciousness, we need to find regions of the brain that are capable of doing that. So if you find a region of the brain that's too unsophisticated or not able to represent uh, uncertainties over possibilities, then you know you have found uh, you have not found the neural correlate of consciousness. So this might push our look for the neural correlate of consciousness to parts of the brain you might not otherwise have expected, those that are capable of more, um, maybe accumulation of evidence and a more sophisticated representation of, um, of uncertainties or other kinds of circuits that are more sophisticated than the ones we might have been looking for to begin with. So that potentially narrows our search for the neural correlates of uh, consciousness. So I think this is a big topic, and I've tried just to summarize sort of the, the basic points. I'd be happy to talk to people. Um, I'll certainly be happy to talk about it in Q&A or happy to talk to you about it later or shoot me an email if it's a topic that interests you. Um, I think it has a lot of implications uh, that are worth exploring, and I've only explored a few of them. So thanks very much. Do we have time for questions? Um, do you mind calling the questions for me? Very interesting. I'm trying to understand better what you are saying. So, obviously, when I'm experiencing something, there is there might be uncertainty on mapping it onto a category. Your friend Isaac is a good example. I could see a blurry picture, and there is some uncertainty whether this is Isaac or not. But the experience itself of this blurred image is, to me, is a single certain uh, experience. Whether I'll ma be able to successfully map it onto Isaac or not. That is uncertain. But the experience itself, are you arguing that I'm not even sure whether I see the blurred image that might be Isaac? Yeah, so, we need, so some people think that in perceptual consciousness there's already categorization. So those people are going to respond to the Isaac case in, think, in thinking that there is uncertainty there in the perception itself. Other people might think that all, I think this is wrong, but other people might think that all categorization happens after the conscious perception. So one of the reasons I list so many examples is to provide other kinds of examples. So when you see something in the distance, an object in the distance, the, the trail marker in the distance, there's uncertainty about its color. It's not the case that there's Again, some you're blurred... You're mapping it into a category of a color. Exactly. But, but, the, but the experience itself might be a mixture that is not easy to map to a color. So what is the color in the None experience of itself? do not map on a category. Uh, they are all based on being uncertain in mapping it on some kind of a category. So, so I don't think that's true. So a lot of them have to do with estimations. So that has to do with, say, the angle at which you've turned. Or it has to do with the strength of a light. So those aren't categories. But even if you think that, um, so even so, you should think that conscious perception, in a way, is, has a phenomenological unity. I'm not saying there's many different phenomenal states. I'm talking about what's represented by the conscious perception. And so its estimates are going to, okay. I'm just gonna, you know, like really push on the same thing. So, okay. what is the uncertainty of a black room? You know, like I'm just looking at nothing. What is my uncertainty estimate there? There might be no possibilities that are represented, and so there might not be no be no uncertainties d distributed over them. At the level of belief, you might have a lot of uncertainty. Is this a living room, a dining room, or a kitchen? But no, the no, level no, 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 I'm not. But I'm at not the level of perception, all this, all, of all yeah. the space of not possibilities, I'm just, I'm, you yeah. know, I'm in a room, dark room with no sound. It's just black but I'm having an experience of actually being there, very intense. So what, in your account, how do I, how do I end, you know, I'm, I'm gonna try to put it very bluntly, you know, because it's where, you know, like Rafi was kind of pushing you, right? There's no categories there, and it's just very definite. So 
So, so the, we have to distinguish two things, the phenomenal character of a perception and what the perception represents. So the, the experience you describe has a very definite phenomenal character, okay? but it doesn't have a very definite uh, what it represents. So the, the view I have, I didn't go into this part of it, this is another part of the view, is that these experiences have definite phenomenal characters that are distinct from, say, the other experiences, but that what the uncertainty is at the level of what they represent. And I think the mistake lots of people make is that they assume that having a definite phenomenal character means there has to be a definite possibility that's represented and there's no room for assignments of, of uncertainty. But wouldn't that then be post-perceptual? Because what we are, what we worried is about the phenomenal character, right? So that's what you know, we're, we usually worry about. Um, so many people think that perception has two elements, that it has a phenomenal character and it has representational element to it. And this is the claim about the representational element of it. So I don't know who we is in that claim, but um, when, when, we think about consciousness, when we think about conscious perception, we should think about more than just a feeling. We should think about representations of the world as being a certain way. And the claim is that to characterize, when we think about it, to char properly characterize the phenomenal character of these perceptions, you can't just describe the representation of one way the world could be. You have to, you have to talk about many ways the world could be, which are then weighted by uncertainties. So. Maybe that's a more helpful way to think. Think about the representations as explaining or corresponding to the phenomenal characters this way. So um, given your answer, I, I'm not sure you would disagree with me, but just uh, proposing a simple experiment, supposing that uh, I represent uncertainty in my actual phenomenal experience, I should be unable to draw a picture of your friend Isaac from a distance, right? Because there isn't a single picture, there isn't a single point, esti point estimate that represents your friend Isaac from a distance. However, I would suppose that given some talented drawing, I would be able to draw that, and, and so would you. So, so in, in the Isaac case, you can get around it by just drawing the features, like the color and the shape. But let's focus on another, another kind of case. Suppose there's an object in the distance, and there's uncertainty about its color. And then you're stuck, how am I going to paint that on, um, how am I going to draw that? And I actually claim there's a respect in which all paintings, all photographs, are distortions of our actual phenomenology, precisely because they impose determinacy on the colors of objects and shapes and objects in the distance that doesn't really exist within our own conscious perception. So that means I should be able to look at this super realistic image and look at my experience and say, no, I'm experiencing something different. Here. That's exactly right. I think that's true. That seems like a simple experiment. Well, we didn't, it's not even an experiment. We could just uh, take a snapshot and look at, look at the scene in front of you. And, I mean, certainly, we have to rely on introspection here, but mine is that they do not perfectly match. According to my experience, a certainty and consciousness can be doubly dissociated. So you can see something consciously and be unsure about it, uncertain. And you can see something unconsciously, subliminally, and nevertheless be sure about uh, your answer. Because they are an intuitive, habitually intuitive decision makers who are b uh, used to base their decisions on their gut. Mm -hmm. And they can be completely sure about their responses. That so the, yeah. the, two, the two dimensions are dotted. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. So if, if I think you've asked most people, um, they would say that if you, if you drew a kind of graph, there's one, there's one box that can't be filled, and that's the one with uncertainty and consciousness. And so you're exactly right. One implication of the view is that all of the boxes are live options. Uh, uncertainty and consciousness can double dissociate. I was wondering uh, what you make of a rivalry situation or ambiguity situation. I think there's tons of evidence that at the conscious level we cannot entertain multiple interpretations anymore. And we sample, there is a beautiful paper by Alex Pouget also, uh, Moreno Boat, showing that we seem to sample from the distribution of possibilities, but we are unable to track them all. The same for garden pass sentences, for instance, which are ambiguous, and whenever they are ambiguity, basically. I think that's absolutely true. So the view is not that whenever there's a representation of uncertainty, that that can be elevated into consciousness. There are some mechanisms that seem to involve collapse. So binocular rivalries are a good example. You see the house, you see the face, but you don't enter really entertain uncertainties about them at once. And then there are other cases where it seems you do consciously entertain 
um, uncertainties about several possibilities. So one interesting project, for me at least, is to see what neurally distinguishes these two kinds of cases. Why in the case of ob colors of objects in the distance, or orientations of things that are of low contrast, do we seem capable of entertaining um, conflicting propositions? Whereas in the case of, the, of a binocular rivalry, it seems, the mechanisms in the brain always lead to a collapse in those uncertainty representations. Um, so I think you're pointing to a real phenomenon that needs, ultimately needs a neural explanation. But I don't think it shows that the, the, the general point that there can't be uh, representations of uncertainty in consciousness. We have time for one more question. I'm going to take up on uh, Rafi's question again because I, I, the answer did not set my mind. Um, okay. I might have a very definite blurred representation that can have many interpretations. So in terms of what I experience, it is one thing. And if, for instance, I was asked to, uh, to say whether it's short or tall, for that I might have in the, the information. And th then for this classification, I might have no uncertainty at all. But then this blurred image could be John, uh, Shlomo, or whatever, the Isaac, uh, because they all this ambiguous figure, which is very, um, definite, which is one percept, can match different classifications, which are post-perceptual or post-phenomenal. So I'm not sure. Yeah, in, in some cases, when you look at a blurred image, perceptually you don't get any, any particular identity. And there's some kind of reflective act where, you act where you have to try to match it with, say, a stored representation of, of Shlomo or Isaac or somebody else. But there are other cases when the identification seems to be in the perception itself. Because of expectations. Perhaps. So one. Yeah, but, but then it's not it's the, the image plus the added activation from a, a, a yeah. memory representation that That's gives right. some image that is more, um, more similar to, uh, to Isaac. And then when it's going to get closer, this activation is going to disappear because there's a mismatch. So what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make here is that your phenomenal experience is one or the other, and it might fluctuate with the kind of information you're going to add to it, which might be, um, um, expectations, or you know, any any anything that's not strictly perceptual, but is going to so, affect your yeah. So I'm inclined to think that these kinds of expectations can filter down into the conscious awareness itself. So the expectation that it's Isaac, or then you look at the blurry image, might lead you to actually perceive, consciously perceive. And that's not through some further post-conscious reflection. That's part of the conscious perception right, itself. But it's, one. but, it's but not it's not. That's what I'm trying to say. It's you not. have one. Fin Feminology, uh, perceptual. Okay. Sorry. I'm just going to say there's probably coffee down there. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. approaching it. Pretty sure you're going to find it there. Thank, thank you again for your time. We have a 30 minute. Okay. Thanks, everybody.